Well, a very warm welcome to everyone out there um, and a huge thanks to Abu Dhabi Art for hosting us today. This is the last in the series of summer talks that have been organized by the wonderful team at uh, Abu Dhabi Art. Yala Nusebi, the fair director, um, who's been working with Roxanne Zand on this series. Then we have Marie V. Pasqua, Michelle Farrell, um, and Nawaf Al, uh, Al Harmi. And uh, thank you all so much for um, working with us uh, to do this. Um, it's really a great pleasure for us all to be here. Um, and I'm sorry, we can't actually see you in person, but we know there are lots of you out there. Uh, at the last talk on the 24th of June, I think it was, chaired by Mariam Eisler, we heard from Maria Sukar about the way artists in Lebanon were responding to the desperate state of their country. And this was even before the devastating explosion on August the 4th in Beirut that killed and wounded so many and destroyed so much. I'm sure you will all be wishing our friends there all the strength they need at this difficult time. Our talk today is focusing on globalism and art collecting with particular regard to the Middle East and South Asia. And sadly, there is no greater epitome of globalism than this dreadful virus, COVID-19, which has literally affected every country in the world. And with communities, many of those who are already suffering concrete conflict across our region, doubly affected. And my first question to each of our panelists will concern that. But first, let me introduce this wonderful group of people. And you can read more ab about them uh, in their bios, but just to give you a quick uh, taste. So Lady Alison Miners is chair of the Royal Academy Trust here in, in London. Among uh, um, many of the things that she's done at the Royal Academy is uh, to set up a hardship hardship fund for students, something that is very close to her heart. Asif Rangunwala is chair of the Rangunwala Foundation, uh, which is an extraordinary foundation, very, very important, um, with huge uh, charitable interests, which include education, marginalized communities, um, uh, and many other things that um, Asif will talk to us about as far as art is concerned. Um, then uh, we have Taymor Hassan, who is a major collector of Middle East and South Asian art and um, many works from his uh, prodigious collection have been featured in a number of exhibitions um, uh, these last years. Kamir Maliki is also a collector uh, but he's uh, also uh, a, a, cu a curator, a fair director, he's been involved with the Istanbul Art Fair, he currently is the director of Volta, he's an, also an art patron um, involved with the Aga Khan Museum and then finally, Ahmed Matar is a renowned artist from Saudi Arabia, involved in many of the art initiatives uh, currently taking place in the kingdom. So our structure this afternoon is that we'll have about an hour altogether. Each of the speakers will have uh, six minutes, I think it is. Um, they will show some images as part of their presentations and we'll take the questions at the end. So if you can type them in, then um, I'll, be, I'll be seeing them um, at, at the end. We should have about 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, but before uh, hearing from the speakers on our, uh, uh, talking about our subject in more detail, as far as it concerns them, I wanted to ask you each a very quick question. And for that answer, you've really got um, about two, two minutes max, I think it is. Um, my question is, is this, within the worlds that you each inhabit, do you think this pandemic is bringing us together or is it creating selfishness and self-interest? Alison. Thank you so much, Venetia. And first of all, thank you to the fabulous Abu Dhabi team for including me. I'm very honoured to be speaking with such a wonderful group um, here today. Um, I think that um, uh, COVID... Um, uh, really the answer to your question is both because we are both united and divided to some extent we're forced into a place of self-interest by our isolation the things I think which unite us generally are that it's a shared global issue that some people are united by death and loss by sh uh, by feelings of shared fear uh, and anxiety by the dearth of information 
and perhaps at last addressing some important differences uh, in cultural and social issues, for example, in Bain. Uh, ironically, I think we're divided by some of the very things that unite us, by death and loss. Those who come through COVID and those who have not yet had it, uh, those who feel therefore able to socialise uh, and those who don't. Poverty and wealth very much to the fore, frontline workers and those who are able to isolate and work from home. Global restrictions and quarantining and the different views that each of us have on the right path to address COVID. Um, in the art world, I think that the issues that unite us are the widespread virtual access and participation in art forums like this one, some brilliant initiatives uh, like here, the artist support by Matthew Burroughs, which encourages artists to sell their works for £200 when they've sold five of them, reach 1000 They pledge to uh, purchase another work for 200 by another artist. There's um, Guts Gallery selling, uh, which is a selling show, which is aimed at bringing in a new generation of younger collectors, of younger artists, and for which many of the funds go to Free Black University. Also uniting us, the virtual programs we run at the Royal Academies, we have, um, we have uh, tours of Gauguin and the Impressionists, Mary Beard will take us round the uh, main collection. We have children's programs, family programs. And to some extent, the internet, I think, can equalize the art world. Um, anyone can view or buy works from galleries and auctions, and we're no longer constrained by location. But equally in the art world, we're divided by restricted access to art events, cancelled art events, uh, perhaps from the artwork itself, from standing in front of the works which we maybe took for granted that we had access to. Thank you, uh, in, thank you, Alison. Thank, thank okay. you very much. Just thank to you. say that I think our focus needs to be on, on setting ourselves outside the divisive rhetoric and actions and to seek to unify um, through, you know, positive gestures and positive words. Thank you. You've given us a lot to, to, to think about. Asif, what are your thoughts on this question? Uh, that's it, right. Um, uh, Robin, thank you very much for having us on this platform. And uh, I really appreciate it. But why is Kanyar's face not on? Why is it only the name? And Lady Allison, I think, has put it really, really well that, you know, she's, she's covered a lot of it. From a personal point of view, um, I believe that there are a lot of good things that have come out of this. I have to go up also. I hope it will not cut off, no? Okay, so uh, I, I, I believe that um, from a personal point of view, it's, it's given me a lot in terms of uh, one is catching up with all the work that was still, you know, waiting to be caught up with because we were all so busy in our lives. So these five months have been great. I think from an art perspective, uh, uh, like Lady Allison said, I think, you know, it's, it's brought a lot of people together. There is a lot of grief and there's a lot of sadness, but there's also uh, happiness where I think families who were sort of split up or, or, or couples who weren't getting along, didn't have a choice, have started to get along. So I think it's, it's had its positive effects. And in terms of the art that's going to come out of this era, I think is gonna have a lot to say for younger artists who, who struggled. And, and I do know I have my own children who are in their 20s and their 30s. And one of them is struggling with life because of all of this stuff. So I think the expressionism that's going to come out of it is going to be great for all of us as not only people who love art but as collectors. Thank you. And what about you, Timur? Um, is this uh, is this bringing us together, or is it about self-interest? Uh, well, I think I think collecting is uh, is is a pretty selfish exercise at the best of times. Uh, so I, I won't be as positive. One of the one of the one of the selfless aspects of it is is the is the academics, the artists, uh, the curators. Um, the, the other parts of uh, the art infrastructure and the institutional infrastructure of the art world that you get to meet and interact with in person and see the art in person uh, that we've actually lost in the last few months. Um, so, you know, from my perspective, 
I, I think the whole act of collecting is in any way a, a fairly selfish enterprise. Uh, and the selfless aspects of it, uh, the ability to be able to share it with others, um, share it in different places and different communities, um, unfortunately, the, the current events have made that harder. Um, so I, I think, you know, from all the positives um, the other panelists have already spoken about, um, just, you know, just the, uh, maybe a little bit of um, disappointment that we haven't been able to do those things and hopefully um, in the future um, we'll again be able to. Thank you. Kamiar, what about you? I'm mute, sorry about that. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I look at it from a more per positive perspective, actually, from an artistic point of view. I think when you are in such a pandemic and uh, are faced to be at home, you know, maybe in a time of crisis and, uh, you know, uh, creativity is at its highest. So I think in the uh, maybe we, you know, of course, we'll, we'll talk about mental health and all that kind of issues that this brings along as well. But maybe this will bring up a whole new boom of artists that will create fantastic and creative works uh, that we can benefit from in the, in the near future. So obviously I, I run an art fair, we're here for Abu Dhabi Art Fair, this is now virtual. So for us, this is crazy times and we have to constantly think outside the box and try to find ways to engage with our clients and with our loyal support and uh, you know, and these are one of the ways that we can do this. So from a, from a different perspective, the same angle, uh, we just have to find ways on how to collaborate more. Yeah. Thank you so much. And what about you, Ahmed, finally? Bringing us together or Yes, selfish? yeah, I think in, in both sides, it's very important. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for the digital age that allowed us to meet. Today we are meeting here because this problem. Uh, online. So this is help a lot in, in many cases, but at the same time, in, in 2018 and 19, we see uh, uh, in many news that the doctors uh, starting to prescribe a museum visit as a, as a solution. So it's, it's, yeah, and that's happening uh, that last time. But now we saw in the last pandemic, before this pandemic that's happening, we put everything on theology because people need it, need something uh, close to uh, our heart. And nowadays, I be, the art and culture become big, big things that people connect or reconnect again, which is can fill ourselves from inside, which is very important philosophy. And uh, at the end now, I think because we facing same problem, all of us worldwide. So I think there is a lot of revise for the political, system everywhere, how the capital life forget the health and the research center and many things in, in economy, which is becoming the voice now more and more. So I think it's positive in making us think how to solve our system in, in future. Thank you. Thank you to all, all of you for your, for your insights there. I'm, I'm taking away quite a lot of po positivity, which is very good in this, in this world. Um, so, Alison, now I'm going to start with, uh, with you again. Um, those of us living in London are so fortunate to have the Royal Academy uh, literally on our, on our doorsteps. And year after year, these extraordinary exhibitions unfold. Um, and we have every year the summer exhibition, which actually this year um, has been a, a casualty of uh, one of the many casualties of uh, Corona, although I believe that it, it is going to actually uh, finally happen towards the end of this year. But could you tell us, Alison, a little bit about the Royal Academy for people who don't, who don't know about it? It's such an extraordinary institution, how it functions and what is your own, own role and special interest there? Sure. Well, behind me is the Royal Academy. That's not my house. That's the Royal Academy. And for those of you who um, uh, have enjoyed the summer exhibition, you might recognise that set. Uh, with all the people behind me. That was the last summer exhibition and perhaps I'm a little bit in mourning. So the Royal Academy was uh, started in 1768 by a group of 36 artists, some of whom were international, who went to the then reigning monarch, George III, and asked him if they could form an academy and he said yes. So we have been blessed in retaining always the uh, reigning monarch as our patron, currently Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Um, but that is not what the Royal Academy is fully about at the moment. The first thing that those academicians did was to open a school. 
and that started in 1769. And the second thing they did was start the summer, summer exhibition in order to fund the schools. Now the schools um, are, to this day, the only, we have the only three year postgraduate uh, course in the whole of Europe where no fees are paid by the students. And that is really important uh, because I think that what it does for the students who are applying, we have about 800 applications a year for 17 places, is that it uh, gives an equilibrium to the experience for those students. Uh, the students are not selected on their ability to be able to afford the fees, but on their abilities alone. The other uh, very special aspect of the, the schools is that we still are taught by artists and architects. That was how it began and that's how it uh, remains. Now you can see up on screen at the moment some of the pictures from the schools um, uh, which are recent um, uh, students, actually they're existing students, I'm just looking at them and I'm recognising them now. Um, the, only re the only sort of criteria for applying are that you can speak English so that you understand the lectures. Most of our students have uh, completed a BA um, and the course is about deepening the practice rather than teaching. You asked me about the Royal Academy and you know, the basis of, of, of the Academy. Um, for the first 100 years, uh, you're just seeing at the moment one of the um, graduating classes. For the first 100 years, all that we had were the schools and the summer exhibition. Uh, and then um, about 100 years later, we started doing international shows. Um, in 1931, I think, um, uh, uh, was our first Persian show. Um, in 1947, we had um, uh, a focus on India and Pakistan. In 1962, 5,000 years of uh, Egypt. Uh, 1967, I think, was Afghanistan. So we began the international shows and I wanted to say that because I think it's really important to link today with some of our international connections which have arisen through our exhibition program. Absolutely. I mean, that's so interesting that, you, that you've actually combined um, the, the, the shows of mainstream artists um, with these, these big um, international ex exhibitions. And I wanted to ask you about the, the students. I mean, that's a huge number that you, that you, that you get to, to who, who apply. And they, where do they all come from? And, and are there issues now that you can foresee for the, for the future, not only with, uh, with Corona, but you know, maybe uh, difficulties people will have coming from across the world? Well we have students from from many different countries and have had historically but you're right to point out that there are issues arising and I'm afraid Brexit is re rearing its ugly head um, in this regard in that we may have issues around visas but we are uh, lobbying hard to um, uh, make an exception um, because we have an independent course and I know that Eliza Bonham Carter, who runs the schools, feels passionately, as do the students, that the mix of international students is absolutely vital to the creative process. The Royal Academy has always, although it's got the exhibitions, although we are about uh, bringing the best exhibitions that we can to the widest public, public our, our mission is also about deepening the practice of art, um, the materials that are used, the dialogue between students from all different corners of the world is absolutely vital to that creative process. And so we would be very disturbed if we were not able to continue to welcome international students. We uh, currently have um, Harminder Judge, who is um, a British born but of Sikh descent. Um, I remember in 2013, we had um, Adam Faramawe, who was Egyptian descent, but born in Abu Dhabi. Um, we had in 2010, I think five, Burki from Lahore, Prem Sahib, um, Kamiya, you'll, you know very, very well, who, was, uh, who, who graduated in 2013, British born, but of Indian descent. So this mix is incredibly important to us. Well, thank you so much for, for that. That's really, really fa fascinating. And especially this global reach of what, of what you do and with the, with the students, obviously it is so important that, 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 that students just get to meet everyone possible from across the, the, the world. Um, I'm going to turn now to Asif. Um, 
as if you're chair of an absolutely extraordinary and generous foundation that was established, I believe, by your late father. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the role that art plays in the world that you inhabit? Yeah. And where did this actually come from? Right. Thank you very much. Um, so I suppose I can start at the beginning, which is right here, as you see this picture. This is an Hermitage uh, in St. Petersburg. And uh, I was 12 years old and I went on a school trip and the art teacher was with me and he started to talk about these paintings. And I think, I think it's one of those defining moments in, in each of our lives, which sort of either gets you into it or doesn't. And so this is where my passion for art started. And I, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not an artist by any means. And I'm, and I'm not even very good at drawing, but the rest of my family, they're all really good at it. They must have got it from my wife. Um, but <laughs> this is where I started. And I will, you know, rapidly move through my, the first 10, 15 years of my life where um, I did a lot of studying about artists, whether you take uh, uh, Greek Roman architecture or whether you take the Impressionist age or the Renaissance. All these things were so exciting to learn about. And to learn about each one of these individuals was just fascinating to me. And I think that's what really got me going with the art world. Uh, move uh, fast track on to 76 when I first started my working career at the age of 17. Uh, I, get the, I have the opportunity, my father, who as you said correctly, established the Ramunala Foundation. He, he, he was very much a community person and believed in uh, giving the opportunity to young people and specifically women to prosper and, and to learn and to be able to use their skills to earn money from. And in 1986, I came across a relatively young, a young artist by the name of Rifat Alvi, who helped me to start the VM Art Gallery in 1987. And we had our first opening where you can see here for those from our region who know the, the Hamdard Dawahana, the Hamdard, Hamdard is a very famous um, uh, uh, region. And this is Hakim, the Hakim himself is, is looking at our, our art. So it was obviously for people like that to be there was very encouraging. The VM Art Gallery itself over the last 20 plus years has, has introduced at least over 980 artists. We've had over 1,100 exhibitions. Uh, and, and this was very much related to art from within Pakistan. And as, as I spent more and more time at the community center and working in, in social welfare, I found that uh, we had artists, but we lacked all other, uh, you know, facets of the art world, which was whether it's restoration or frame making or, or even education in arts just didn't really exist at that early stage. Uh, but what I did provide uh, through the community center was a space for any artist, whether you're educated or not educated, to be able to have a free place to express themselves. Can I just cut in, cut in there? I said, thank you. That's so interesting. I want, I, I understand that the VM um, gallery also has a very strong link with the Prince's School of Decorative Arts in, in, in London, um, because obviously craft is something that you're very interested in as well. So t well, tell us about that. A that's, bit. that's really, really interesting. About six, seven years ago, I visited the Prince's School of Traditional Arts in Islington, here in London. And I looked at it and it was, it was a building with a lot of equipment, a lot of people, and it just looked so simple. I said, okay, I would like to have one of these. And so I spoke to the director there. Uh, uh, I think his name is Mr. Azam. And Azam said, well, let's work together. And what I found is that in, in, in that, uh, the, 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 you know, the passing on of knowledge and education in the program that the PSTA runs. And, and as you know, that they have it in Saudi Arabia. I think now they're establishing potentially one in the UAE. Uh, we've got one in Pakistan, they've got it in Malaysia, they've got it in China, and they have it in three, four other, um, uh, nor what you would call as the 
um, um, uh, Central Asian countries, right? Uzbekistan and 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 so on. Uh, what what that provided was all of a sudden a surge of of individuals wanting who you know who who were not necessarily just students but slightly mature people in their 30s and 40s wanting to coming back to art they started to come to the center to actually take class, classes and the objective is that uh we well we got stuck in this last year but by by the end of 2021 we should be able to provide our own diploma courses for kids and for students and for teachers and 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 i all credit to the psta that you know they've involved they've worked with us to involve these courses evolve these courses to suit our own people and i would recommend one of these in every country that exists because well, I think thank Thank you. I mean, all credit to you for, for working with them and thank you for, for, the, for telling us about all this fascinating work that you, that you do. So uh, now, Taymor, um, you started as a history graduate at Yale and you are now in the process of creating um, a, a collection that spans the Middle East and South Asia, which is very much the topic of our theme to today. But could you tell us what is the aim of your collection? And is there a message that underlies it? What, what is it that, that, that knits all this extraordinary collection to, to, together? Thank you, Venetia. Um, you know, given the title of the forum, I, I thought I'd just show some works um, that I've collected over the last 10 years um, that show how artists grappled with, uh, with their own post-colonial identity as the modern nation states we now know in, uh, in Middle East and, and South Asia were taking shape. Um, I've always been struck by the similarities in approach um, across the region as artists considered questions relating to personal and national identity in that sort of post-war period. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to show through these slides that they used imagery that borrowed um, equally from Islamic and pre-Islamic sources. Uh, and they worked in a style um, inspired by contemporaries from the West to express um, a new um, sort of modern um, identity. And, you know, I, I was saying earlier that collecting is, is, is a very selfish exercise. Um, a lot of it and a lot of these questions about identity uh, were things that interested me uh, on an intellectual level. Uh, and in, on a sort of uh, discovering a part of uh, intellectual or cultural history that wasn't easily accessible. Um, so hopefully um, through a few, a few um, paintings, I can, I can try to show some of those links and, and, and some of where that interest comes from. I'm starting with a, a Pakistani artist called Rashid Arain um, that actually um, Asif showed at VM Gallery in an important show in 2014 called Homecoming because Rashid Arain left, uh, left uh, Pakistan in uh, 1964 and his work wasn't really shown there till actually Asif's gallery um, brought it back. Um, and, and, and in some of this, um, uh, some of this post-colonial work, I think it's really interesting if you look at the first painting um, at the top, um, he's using, the artists from that generation used um, uh, one of two styles to sort of express a break from the kind of academic um, painting that prevailed in the Indian subcontinent um, prior to uh, the, the onset of modernity. In this case, he's using uh, a style of, you know, there was a going back to using watercolor on paper, uh, rustic imagery uh, in the art of the Bengal school in the 1930s that inspired Rashid's work uh, via the creation of the modern nation state of Pakistan. The Eastern wing, Bangladesh belonged to, uh, was, was part of Pakistan then, and Rashid was very inspired by that form of, uh, uh, form of art making. But also many artists, including Rashid himself, uh, borrowed an idiom from Western contemporary painters from the School of Paris and, 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 and a lot of the work that was being done in, in, in the West, again, to, to express a, a abstracted post-colonial um, uh, identity um, in, in, uh, in rejection of a colonialist one that was sort of handed down um, at, at the British Indian art schools um, that existed. Uh, Rashid in particular is very interesting because he migrates uh, to England and then becomes a part of the diaspora and is a, a, a large voice for racial equality and justice, um, both on a personal level, but also um, as an artist uh, to be accepted as part of the mainstream um, European dominated um, um, art narrative, um, as it were. Uh, the, the work on the right actually shows his use of, um, uh, of his contrasting an exoticized East or, or a version of an exoticized East with, um, with, with 
horses and soldiers protecting a far right um, racist, um, quasi racist political rally. Um, I also start with Rashid because in 1989 he held a really important ex exhibition called um, The Other Story that he curated um, at, at the Hayward Gallery here in London, um, where for the first time in, in, in the UK at least, artists from the post-colonial states were brought to the forefront. Um, and he actually influenced, uh, and, and, and the work of this exhibition influenced a lot of the institutional thinking on art from the region and also uh, collectors um, such as myself. If you could move, move to the next slide. I'm going to need to rush you a little bit. You've got a lot, a lot to you know, show. We're just going to see the slides instead of me talking. Um, this is in, 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 in Iraq, uh, two important artists using Islamic um, imagery and, and, and pre-Islamic imagery, the horse, the crescent, um, Islamic architecture. Um, Dia Zabi was trained as an architect in Iraq and he employed, again, abstracted Western-based uh, painting to express a sort of a novel um, national identity. Uh, Kadim uh, work, which is on the right, goes back to Karbala and, uh, and, and the start of uh, the Shia, uh, Shia Islam. And the horse here is used as a, as, as a negative figure, the imagery of the horse, the abstracted horse. Um, and obviously the, the, this uh, painting in Baghdad in the 50s and 60s um, was, uh, was, it was a, a sort of a new generational break from the kind of painting that prevailed in the Arab world before it. Um, a similar thing was happening in Iran um, in the early 1960s. Um, uh, a generation of artists, um, Zendarudi and Tanavali uh, being uh, part of them, um, used um, early Islamic um, uh, geometry and um, mathematics and symbolism, both folk uh, and urban, uh, to express uh, a, a novel view on Iranian culture that harked back to a traditional, um, a traditional pre-colonial um, sort of um, uh, uh, imagery. Um, again, in India, um, if we move to the next slide, uh, actually three Islamic painters um, approached the same question in, in similar ways. Uh, in, in, they created a secularist Indian identity that merged aspects of different religious traditions in India. M.F. Hussain here on the left, used um, the horse again, uh, the Islamic symbol, uh, was inspired by uh, Indian temple sculpture, um, by Indian uh, warriors and Indian folk music um, to create um, a, a sort of a secularist, uh, almost Nehruvian um, identity that was also being promoted by the nation state itself in the 50s. Sayyid Mehta on the right, um, his, 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 uh, he's expressing some of the communal um, breaks in Indian society through the falling figure. Um, and lastly, um, Syed Heather Raza moves from European abstracted landscape um, that he was painting in the 1950s uh, in the immediate post-war period. Uh, his work Indianizes more as he goes through his career. So you see the reds and the greens that, um, that he grew up with in the, in the forests of um, central Madhya Pradesh in India, entering into his work. Um, and the, the form of the canvas starts moving from a Western uh, landscape almost to an Indian uh, miniature-like uh, painting. Uh, in a later stage in his career, he introduces Islamic geometry and the Hindu Bindu symbol as well. Again, using abstracted um, forms learned from a generation of, or, or through interacting with a generation of Western painters, uh, but introducing elements of style and form that were truly Indian. Um, lastly, um, this same question of identity continues to the present day um, and I've got two works here, one on the left from Rashid Rana, which takes um, the Islamic form in the macro image, uh, Islamic geometry and, and, and um, the, the Islamic carpet, but micro images actually show that um, contemporary identity in the Islamic world is uh, through, through pictures of slaughterhouses, is, um, it has, has moved to a more violent uh, and a more destructive um, place. Uh, and the last um, work I wanted to show is from uh, Mona Hatoum, who was the only Arab artist faced, uh, featured in that uh, show by Rashid Arayan, uh, The Other Story. Um, her identity is more global, um, like Rashid Rana's, rather than regional, um, as, as expressed by the earlier generation of artists. This is a work I actually um, purchased when I saw it on the next panelist, Kamiar's uh, Instagram, um, while he was um, working with Istanbul Biennale. And of course, here again, the violence, um, the work is called Hotspot, the violence, the political turbulence, um, of, of the contemporary state of, uh, of, of art making and, and, and living in this region is, um, is reproduced. 
Thank you. Thank you. What an insight into your, into your extraordinary collection. Really very thought provoking work. Thank you so much, Tamor. So now um, this leads us very nicely into, into Kamiar. Um, so uh, Kamiar, you come from a, a family of, of collectors and supporters of art and your own work crosses several aspects of what what has been termed the ecosystem of the art world. You're yourself a, a, a collector, you work with other collectors, you also work with the Aga Khan Museum um, and with art fairs. Um, I already mentioned Istanbul and also Volta, so your reach is truly global. Could you encapsulate this for a bit and also just, just maybe give us some thoughts on what are your ambitions and concerns at the present time across the, the sector? Yeah. Sure, thank you very much for having me and thank you Tabor for that information. That's uh, always nice to hear that my Instagram feed works very well so my travels are worth it. So yeah, no, I'm, I grew up in a very uh, sort of, uh, I'm very thankful to have been grown up in a privileged uh, position where my parents have been collectors and supporters of the arts for over 35 years. So um, my involvement in the arts has uh, really uh, staged up in a way that it went from collector to supporter to curator, uh, now fair director. So we've always uh, had the element of support in our background. We've always wanted to give back as much as we learned and educated ourselves in the in the spectrum. So I didn't go from it from a historical point of view. I went to it from a when we left school. My father gave us some money to to say that you're only allowed to buy art with that money, and uh, it got whatever you invest in it stays in it, and whatever you sell, you have to put back into that kind of a, uh, a fund per se. And that's really how we started collecting and. Uh, my, my love of uh, my country of origin, which is Iran, holds no bounds. I obviously can't go back. So I find, I try to find more historical aspects and traditional aspects and with, with the art that I collect. And I, I think we're gonna see some slides uh, of, of some of the pieces that I do collect. Um, you know, for example, you have Amin Monta, uh, uh, this is with my involvement. And, and yes, and some of my ambitions are, again, to give back to the larger community. And, uh, you know, you get, get back more involved with grassroots patronage, you know, companies and, uh, and, and museums like Aha Khan, you know, which are designed basically to unite an impassionate group of supporters uh, to a museum not just by its physical space, but, uh, you know, by its mission, you know, they're based in Canada, you know, we want to uh, bring people closer and closer together to, to what their mission is. And we're basically looking to create a platform, you know, for meaningful dialogue amongst museum supporters throughout the world. Uh, you know, other, other of my uh, initiatives are to support uh, and, and further the careers of uh, unrepresented artists uh, not just by buying them, but uh, finding a platform for them to shine. And, uh, and uh, we're doing this via uh, myself personally, but also via my art fair now, which is uh, Volta Art Fairs. I know we're here to support Abu Dhabi Art Fair, so I won't uh, dwell too much into that. But uh, yeah, basically, the, you know, I think in the next one here, you'll see one of my uh, pieces in my collection, which is Ami Montazemi. Uh, who's uh, an Iranian artist from uh, a gallery called Dastan Basements, uh, who's very energetic and active in promoting uh, arts and culture back in Iran. Uh, he uses uh, Persian miniature paintings as his inspiration uh, to, to make a contemporary art painting. And the next uh, piece you'll see is uh, an Azeri artist, uh, now a country which is close to my own family since my brother married them to uh, an Azeri family. So he's also using, um, you know, the more, more of the traditional uh, sense, which is basically the, the tradition is one of the main factors that uh, combines and creates a society. And he's using that, but uh, then again, interchanging. Uh, this was actually exhibited in the v &A Museum, I think, uh, for the now the Panka Prize Prize. But um, yeah, so, so the idea basically is it's again to get back to support, you know, of course the concerns that we have going forward now is uh, within the museum sector, within the, the furloughing sector, within, you know, the fact that uh, museums aren't getting the fundings that they deserve and can, uh, COVID will, will, will uh, 
bring a lot of this uh, observer thought at the other side again, as I mentioned before, it's showing that we can think outside our box. We learn how to collaborate more, especially now we saw what happened in, in Beirut, how much everybody was collaborating, trying to help each other, uh, support each other, how many initiatives have been coming about, you know, but uh, we're on hold, but again, the artists are not on hold. They are still creating. Thank you, come here. I, I gather you've got a really interesting project going on in France right right now in some kind of magical house some, somewhere in France. I don't know where. It is. <laughs> Tell us about that. Yes, it's uh, more my parents' project, but uh, due to the fact that we're all involved in the art world, we're now chipping into it as well. It's uh, effectively a house very much very similar to the house that we have in London, but. Uh, this comes with a little bit of a difference that we're going to build a, a residency program to it. So again, giving back to the society, what uh, we want to do initially the first few years is uh, create uh, a residency where artists produce work uh, from uh, for the location, but then invite it up to poets, uh, chefs, uh, the multidisciplinary. The first two artists that we worked with, one of them was uh, or is Iranian. Uh, he's uh, a, a student, or he worked in um, Munir Fama Farmoyan's uh, uh, studio, and he has created uh, rooms with uh, 120 or so thousand individual pieces of mirror, which will be exceptional. Uh, then we work with a young Italian artist, so it's multicultural and multidisciplinary, and uh, hopefully. Uh, the residency will take some shape or form in the next couple of years. Oh, that's so exciting to to hear that! Can't wait to see this uh, this, this work. I'm some I'm hoping that somehow you can I'm, bring it I'm, across I'm, to, I'm, to London. I'm, I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. <laughs> yeah. Um. Thank you so much, Camille. Now, Ahmed, over over to you, um, as our last panelist. Um, Ahmed, you're a um, a very major figure in the in the world of art. Your work has uh, consistently reflected these two um, strong aspects of your life, medicine and art. And over the years, you've also focused on the city of Mecca and the Hajj, which I itself is a truly global phenomenon. Um, what is it that drives you with these themes? And can you tell us also about your new project, which has um, a medical title, uh, Prognosis, yes. I, I, I believe? Yes. Yes, actually, uh, 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 you know, I grew up in, 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 uh, in Asir region, which is in, uh, in South uh, Western uh, place in Saudi Arabia region, and uh, there I grew up with the religion, you know, background or theological uh, uh, background with the family and with the life there. But at the same time, because I went to study science, medicine, so I think during the medicine and the time there, I uh, uh, I build my narrative here to work between subjectivity and objectivity, where I find. Uh, 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 it's very important uh, for a humanity. So that's come uh, back to my mind that the art. Then I start by doing artwork. I called it illumination. Then I use the same old style of uh, uh, of a manuscript uh, or uh, uh, or illumination. And this I put the X-ray that I do in hospital or, or work with the patient. And for me, it was very important enlightening of the concept, because at the end, I understand that even the medicine, it's a common sense. We have to communicate. We have to connect to the people, to the human, to the nature. At the same time, after that, uh, I I uh, I uh, go to search more beyond the religion, which I for my my life religion is a basic human need like art and culture it's a, it's something that we uh, all of years in the back there is a lot of story and people who guide us usually in that section so i start with hajj and by minimalizing the concept of hajj which is like global phenomena and uh, very important talk about that and i find that it's the you know when we was uh, kids our families just you know, uh, promise us when you will be older, you will go to the journey of the life, which is the journey of the Hajj. And I use magnet and iron filing. Then I, it's for me that the communication or the attraction, the idea of attraction. After that, uh, 
I think in 2013, that was my really attraction, not only in one journey, but to focus and study and become the destination of, or the journey which becoming the real destination is the journey to explore beyond the Mecca or the Islamic city as a concept of urbanism, as a community health and uh, understanding of the city, as a, a, a background between the old or ancient, ancient history of Mecca as the first house or first home and the future of Mecca which influenced by the capitalism and the movement and the new modernity of the life. So that was a dialogue in my work, which I called it uh, Desert of Paran. Then that was the, the, you can see now in the picture how Mecca full of people like magnet attractions. But within the COVID, it, I was, you know, uh, stuck with when I see first time in my life, Mecca empty. So that was also a big, a big uh, a question for my project, for my research, for my understanding. And it was very important that the government take this action, accept that we should stop, you know, because, you know, Mecca is about everyone. It's about people meeting together. It's about uh, uh, unity. It's about similarity. It's about many things. So within this, it was a for me, uh, a new a new phase in my life, or my artwork, or my understanding, or my following. So it's the first time ever I saw image, or even has this experience uh, uh, with the city life, or with the Mecca, uh, with, with with this feeling. Uh, yeah. So uh, Ahmed, tell me that, about about prognosis, and then because I then want to ask you about uh, things going on in Saudi Arabia to do with that. Yeah, then after that, I'm now working. I, I start with the prognosis and uh, yeah, prognosis is the project that telling the history of 40 years in Saudi Arabia from 79, which has a lot of changes happening until today. And uh, it, it's, 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 it's an unofficial history that studied the uh, social political life that influenced me personally and people around me. And I called it an artist odyssey. So it will be biography, but an, an odyssey. So that's the, the idea that's, about this book. That's, that's so interesting. Um, can you also tell us um, a, a little bit about what's going on in Saudi Arabia t today as far as art? I, I gather you're very in involved um, in a lot of these new initiatives. I mean, it's wonderful to hear that there's going to be, for example, an international art biennale next, next year. So what is, what is driving yeah. all, all of this? I, yeah, if, if, if I can, yeah, if I, I, I usually, you know, see it from my side as a, it's a young energetic movement, which is I really love. And I think it's a good to see something coming new. And, you know, Saudi population is 70% of the population is less than 30 in age. So it's very young, active uh, movement. At, you know, in art and culture, especially, there is a big movement. Yes, there is a different time whereas there was no art school no uh, art education for me uh, myself i couldn't uh, study art at all no way so i i go to uh, medicine as a uh, you know uh, my life take me to this side so and uh, in arab world usually we say that your mother and father will tell you go medicine or lawyer or so it's famous in our uh, social life this thing so uh, I think this energetic movement is very important. It's very nice. I, I, I personally think it should grow organically more and more. We, I don't think we should take fast action. I, I believe it will take its own identity and shape something in you. And I really am a big believer in this movement. Thank you. Thank you. That's so interesting. Well, thank you all um, wonderful speakers. Uh, for your for your insights and and um, fascinating things that you've been telling us about. So now um, I'm going to turn to the questions and hope I can get this this little bit of the technology right. Um, so we have um, we have ten minutes for for questions and I'm just going to take them um, as they as they come. So um, we have a question from Andrew Wynn. 
given the current and ongoing impediments that collectors and the general public face with respect to accessing public collections, what concrete steps can be taken by the universe of private collectors to bridge that gap? Um, it sounds to me this might be a question for, for, for Taimur to start with. Who's going to defer to Asif because he's, uh, he's actually taking those steps and, and I'm not. So I think okay. perhaps Asif can take that one. All right, Asif. Asif, over to you. Uh, you're, he's, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, could you just yeah. repeat the question again, ma'am? Uh, the question is, I think it should come up on your, on your yes. Q&A then. Given it's the current and ongoing impediments that collectors and the general public face with respect to accessing public collections, what concrete steps can be taken by the universe of private collectors to bridge that gap? So, uh, look, I, I, I think that, um, of course, it's, a, it's, it's based on individual collectors like ourselves to be able to show our art and to share our art. I also fully feel that a lot of people are, are occupying the space without allowing people in. But, you know, I, I think in the UK, a lot of the art that's shown at... Uh, at, 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 at the Royal Gallery and, 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 and the Tate and places is being shared by the big collectors like the Khalilis of this world who are, who are, you know, who are, who should be credited for doing the work. We just need more people coming out onto the stage. Of course, art collecting is a very private thing. So people don't want you to really know what they've got or, and, and it is personalized. So, um, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm, I'm not exactly, yeah, I, I, I find it, it's a very tough question. Let's put it this way. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I love that I love for shifting it on to me. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's always a very good tactic. Well, actually, I was going to say that Asif is, he's, he's being modest because he's, he's actually arranged a, a you know, a, a exhibition um, of his private collection um, very recently, just four months ago. Um, and and I you know I would just pause it back to him that that you know he's he's made arrangements for that to be shared widely and, and publicly. Okay, Again, and just to expand on that, I think what we've done is I have bought a couple of art collections, okay, because well because I, I just felt that there were just collections lying there doing nothing, and and one of the objectives is at the VM Art Gallery at least in our region is that every month we try to display one of the artists and we call in the universities and the students and we try to you know, get a hold of the artists whose, whose collection, it, whose art it is to actually talk to the people. Okay, and I think that really drives this agenda. Um, that, that's one way to do it. And I thank them, I thank them for allowing me to, you know, really, <laughs> and Kamiar, you had, I think you, you have a point here as well. Yeah, no, I mean, there have been several collectors who have also been very kindly and, uh, and some uh, uh, galleries like Tamor Gran and Anita Zablodovic who have used this uh, time uh, to actually invite their own collectors and uh, their own clients to do these kind of uh, tourings of their private collections. So it's been actually very interesting to see uh, people sometimes that you have not been in their homes before and, and this has been very active over the last few months. Um, thank you, thank you all of you. Um, so now I have a question from uh, Rada al Harsi. she is an associate lecturer at St Martin's um, and she has a question for Ahmad Martyr. Um, uh, she has two questions but I'm just going to take one, one of yours Rada yeah. if, you don't, if you don't mind. Um, and this is a very interesting one. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been showing an interesting, extraordinary progress in the creative industries. So you mentioned the importance of museums at the time, times of, of COVID. Uh, she's asking, uh, Ahmed, do you think art therapy is something that is on the Saudi art agenda and who could deliver that? Uh, I think yes. Uh, and uh, when we talk, uh, you know, uh, uh, about uh, uh, art as a therapy or art as a, you know, public, I uh, usually like to call public goods, you know, everyone share it. But I think uh, uh, art as uh, therapy is something that, uh, or an, uh, to well-being concept in, in the future will be something that all of the countries will focus on, especially COVID, we learn a lot that we didn't invest in health 
in developing our you know, well-being to, to the life. Of course, art and culture, I mean, could play a big role in giving us much better and healthy cities or environment on the life. And I think that's our role as a new generation to push that and to follow and focus on being part of this change. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, and, uh, and another a question, uh, Charles Sidawi. Um, how can we um, expose Middle Eastern art to a large, larger world audience? Now, who wants to take this one on? This is a big, a big question here. How can we make this, um, this, this world that those of us who know it, it's very much our private club, really. So how do we make <laughs> Middle Eastern well, art so much more accessible? Alison. Vinisha, I'll give you, give you one response. I'm obviously always going to be looking through my lens, apologies. Uh, but there are around the world museums who have Middle Eastern committees. Tate um, uh, have had the Middle Eastern North African Committee uh, for 10 years, uh, run by the fabulous Maria Meisler and Maya Rasamli, and now the beautiful Maria Sukar. Um, and I know that at one point there were only two Saudi members on that group. So perhaps sitting with the Middle Eastern Acquisition Committee at an organization like Tate, I think Guggenheim has one. So there are several acquiring museums and galleries where you can have a voice and acquire work for uh, international, for global museums. For a museum like ourselves, we have bespoke relationships. And so if someone comes to us who's coming from a Middle Eastern background, we're going to be working out a personal relationship about what the donor would seek. Um, thank you. Yes, I mean, we have, we have a similar one at the British Museum as, as well. And obviously, these committees are ex extremely um, important. But I think some of this is actually also how do you make this um, accessible? Maybe it's to do with um, online exhibitions and that sort of thing. I'm going to throw this at, at, at you, Taymor, actually, um, again, because, because with your collection um, and you've been lending a lot of works to um, different exhibitions, what do you think about trying to do more on online ev events now, um, which which sort of really show how extraordinary all this material is that is so inaccessible to a lot of people around the world. I, I think uh, I, I want to have this one. Um, I think um, I, I agree that you know making um, initiatives such as like the Google Arts and Culture Project that makes um, both institutional as well as um, large private collections public is the way, you know, is the way of the future. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think, I, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm quite there yet. I think many collectors feel like they haven't got complete uh, collections or they haven't covered, um, covered every avenue um, that they want to explore. Um, but I, I think it's really important for private collectors to make um, the material that they hold for, for oh, perhaps only for a certain period of time, um, available to uh, not just researchers and institutions, but to the general public. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I can't say I've, I've, I've taken concrete steps in that direction, um, which is why I, uh, I, I passed the last question on to ask if who actually has, um, but, but, you know, uh, absolutely. Uh, maybe we should ask you as well, given your, um, given your uh, role at the British Museum, um, about Middle Eastern art and, and also the relationship with um, private collectors. How, how do you feel that um, that's going to go in the future? Well, I think, I th thank you. I mean, I think it's very, very important, actually, this, this, this wonderful blending of, uh, you know, curators and collectors is part of this, this, this ecosystem. And, and the, the, the committees um, provide a very, very important function in that they enable institutions really to go out and reach out and to, and to, and to acquire. And of course, in a, in a, in a museum, you, you really can um, use, you know, online and all that, all that kind of stuff to make these, this, this 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 material um more accessible so yes i'm very much i think it's an excellent question i'm very much in favor of the dissemination of uh, of this extraordinary um material um i have a we've got time for i think another two questions um i have a comment actually just to pass to you um at allison which is to thank the royal academy for the free resources so actually that's really that's 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 wonderful to hear that those resources are being um used and then i have a a, tr a tricksy question here um, from Margot Adricula. Uh, what are your 
thoughts? I'm going to address this uh, to you, uh, Kamiar, I think. What are your thoughts regarding collecting art purely for financial purposes, i.e. buy and sell for profit? Mm. Should, should I redirect this to Tamor now? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, you can all just keep passing the buck, but if one of you has got to answer this question. <laughs> like, I, I, I think people should buy art first and foremost uh, for pleasure, for the human contact, uh, the, the, the contact it brings to you, between you, the artist, the gallery, the relationship it does, and, and the way you can evolve uh, by the art that you collect, you know, if you buy it for a purely financial purpose, um, you know, you might get dissuaded, you might uh, not reach the results that you think you are because at the end of the day, this is still the only unregulated market left in the world. So you will never uh, truly understand, you know, I always say, even though, let's say mine started out with a sort of fund that my father gave me, but he said, you're only buying art with it. Even if you do sell something, it goes to buy art with it again. So as long as it uh, is kept within the ecosystem, that's the way forward. And, and, and patronage is very important uh, in this field as well. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think it is. I think it is. Well, we've come to the end of our, of our um, magical hour. Um, I want to thank uh, all our speakers um, Thank you so much for all your insights and and the really interesting things that you've that you've that you've been telling us this uh, this this afternoon. Um, I want to thank um, Abu Dhabi Art and um, all of the people I mentioned before, but in particular to uh, Nawaf, um, uh, who is the is the te technician who just holds all of this together. So a huge. Uh, thanks to him and uh, thanks to all our colleagues um, uh, in Abu Dhabi Art, to all of you speakers and to all of you audience who, as I said at the beginning, we can't see you, but we know that you're there and thank you very much for your support. So have a very good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Venetia. Yeah. Thank you, Venetia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.